listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Well, from uh, deep in the holler, high overlooking the hills of eastern Tennessee, we are back. <laughs> uh, my name is Jerry Mitchell. You're for Give Guy 90. Sitting in her new supervisor's chair is Myra. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be back with you guys. <laughs> oh, my. It has been an adventure and then some, but we are here, and uh, hopefully you are too. <laughs> uh, maybe I should uh, explain just a little bit of that opening humor <laughs> for the folks who don't speak English or aren't familiar with Appalachian vocabulary. <laughs> um, in in the Appalachian world, a holler is kind of like a valley or a small valley or a draw that is comes up between two hills. The Appalachians being one of the oldest mountain chains in the United States, uh, formed just after Noah's flood. Uh, and as the, the water rushed westward, okay, uh, it basically what happened is the weight allowed the ground to grow. And in that, <clears throat> we had some smaller hills because of the slow uprising of water as it rushed through and created the Grand Canyon. So there's a little bit of um, creation history for you, if you, if you will. Um, what I uh, have for you tonight is something kind of special. If you know, for a, a long time, oh, I didn't finish telling them about the uh, the deep in the holler, high overlooking the hills is actually an impossibility because you can't be deep in a low spot overlooking high hills. Exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. <laughs> so that's just a little uh, humor there for you. Tonight we're going to do something special. We've been telling you for years now that we... Um, <laughs> We encourage you to live the way your creator designed you to live. And if you do that, your life will improve. And I've had people ask often, well, how do I know? You know, what do I see? What, you know, what, how do, what do I experience when I do that? So I think tonight being our, our first time after this, kind of a drastic move. <laughs> If we can say that, <laughs> yes. um, what we, what I can tell you tonight is, is a little bit of our story. Um, we were in Colorado working on cattle ranches, guest ranches, and that kind of thing. And I was having a good time. I did not ever think I was going to do anything any different. Uh, but as my parents aged, as Myra's parents aged, we got a phone call and uh, made the decision to go back to where we grew up and uh, didn't realize everything that was going to take place when we did that. And <clears throat> it, it came around in some strange, well, what I think is a strange sort of a way, that when we got back, you know, we were doing the church thing, right? We were going to church and, and kind of picked up where we left off when we, when we first moved away. Well, apparently that was not in the plan that the Creator had for us. <laughs> so as he began to put things in my mind and lay things in my heart, I began to ask questions that no modern Christian pastor could answer. And in doing so, it, it forced me to go find the answer on my own. And I knew where the answers were. I just didn't know where to find them. Of course, the answers are in the Bible. It's just, where are they? And some things are hidden in plain sight. You just have to read it. 
How many times have I said, you just have to read what's written? <laughs> and, and that's just the way it is. If you attempt to force your traditions or your church doctrine, whatever it might be, your ideas and your concepts onto the pages of the Bible, what you're going to get is exactly what you put into it. If you put your traditions into it and you read those traditions into the Bible, you're going to get them back out. But if you slow down and read what is there, you get something different. I had this conversation with somebody the other day I was on the phone with. And his question was, do you observe the Jewish feast? And I said, no. We don't observe, observe the Jewish feasts. The feasts that are outlined in Leviticus 23, the Almighty says, belong to him. So we observe his feasts. Not our feasts, not my feasts, not the Jewish feasts, not the Methodist feasts, not the Baptist feasts, but God's feasts, the Creator's feasts, the way he designed them. We can't keep them the way he tells us to keep them because, well, there's no temple in Jerusalem, so you can't do that. So you observe them the best you can. I've said this time after time, exactly like the exiles did when they were living in Babylon. You had to do the best you can with what you have to work with. And when we began doing that, things began to change dramatically. <laughs> sure did. As we were looking, you know, we, were, we were back in Delaware, we were, you know, Myra was going to work for the hospital. We were taking care of my aging and um, infirmed, at that point, parents. Uh, several trips to the hospital, basically watching my father deteriorate every day. And as we were doing that, we were also looking for a house. <laughs> And, you know, you, we went through the steps, right? You know, because in the United States, you do the things you do. Um, basically, you, you do everything you can to get your finances straightened out. You get pre-approved. You know how much you can borrow to, to buy a house. And, and you go through all those steps. Well, we did all that. We found a, a realtor we thought we could trust and deal with. And, and she was good. Um, you know, she bent over backwards to do everything she could do for us. Um, we found a few houses. We had three or four contracts on different houses over the period of about two or three years, maybe. Something like that. Um, one, but we never were able to successfully buy a house. And the strangest things kept coming up, you know, uh, the, the one um, the, the people had a contingency on that if they didn't get the job they were going to get, then the deal was off and that happened. and We didn't get that one. And, and there were other things, you know, as we were looking that would come up. You know, we just knew that this particular house wasn't right. We would see something, well, it would be okay, but, you know, do we want to spend this much money and have to spend you know, that much money all over again to fix it up? But the, the, the deal the deal breaker for me, <laughs> and, and you can kind of laugh at this a little bit, <clears throat> I think. We had a contract on a house, and in Delaware, you hire a lawyer who does the title search. He makes sure that everything is right and that the house is free and clear. You know, there's, there's no problems with previous owners and that kind of thing. And he called one day and said, I can't let you buy that house. Why not? The bank that is selling that house doesn't own it. This is a problem. <laughs> and it was at that point I said, okay, we're done. Obviously, we're not supposed to buy a house right now. And I didn't realize it immediately. It, it took me some, some time to look back at this and realize that it wasn't bad luck. You know, it wasn't um, coincidence. It wasn't circumstance. This was the Almighty working, saying, I don't want you here. You don't, you know, you're not staying here. I need you somewhere else. 
and, and when you look at it like that, it changes things. It changes things dramatically. And what we can see through all of that, especially now, because when we, when the time came, we knew we had to be moving because the house we were in was being sold. It was okay. Where are we going? And we started looking around. I started looking around. And I, I had a list of what I thought was criteria. <laughs> you know, people plan, God laughs, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, we looked at various places. We knew we liked the western states, but Colorado was kind of going to be out of the question for a few reasons. One is it's become very expensive to live there because of the legalization of marijuana. There were some other things. So we looked at Wyoming, and we talked about it and said, we're getting older. It gets cold in Wyoming. Now, when I say cold, <laughs> it's cold. there is a place on the temperature scale where Celsius and Fahrenheit meet, and it's 40 below. And it happens often in the winters in Wyoming. <laughs> Along with the gale force wind. Yeah. Blowing snow. So we we sort of decided this might not be a good idea. <laughs> so um, we we kept looking, kept looking. Why Tennessee hit my radar, I don't know, um, but it did. I think the father sent that radar. <laughs> I, I yeah, but I don't know why he's got us here. I have no idea, but I can say this: when we came down and started looking around. What we found were some of the friendliest people we've been around in a long time. We've looked around and we've seen things. The, the country is beautiful. If you look at um, we, when we've seen this, um, what happened was the, the realtor just kind of some look. It never hurts to just go look and, and see if there's something that you like or something you don't like, something you can fix. So we came and we looked at this place, and what we found um, was that there wasn't just one kitchen in the house. There was two. So that sort of alleviated the kitchen's not big enough argument. <laughs> And we looked at it, and, and as we were walking through it, and I knew what the asking price was, and I'm kind of calculating in my mind what it, what it would take to kind of bring it up to not my standard, but what the asking price would be. And we left, and on our way back to the realtor's office, Meyer and I were talking, and I said, he will, you know, the owner will never, never accept the offer that I'm thinking I'm, I'm willing to make on it. Because the offer I was willing to make on it was 30 some thousand dollars less than the asking price. And, and they had already reduced this home almost 60 or $70,000, something like that. There's no way he'll accept it, but we made the offer. And, a few hours later, he came back and said, well, you know, if we do this and we do this, and I said, no, you know, we'll, we'll just reject it. You know, we're not, we're not going to counter bid. We're not going to get into that. We're not going to talk about fix this or fix just, just no, forget it. We'll find something else. Less than 24 hours later, they came back and said, okay, we'll accept your offer. That, you know, sort of <laughs> surprised me <laughs> immensely. <laughs> um, well, well, okay, maybe, maybe this is where we're supposed to be. And as we, you know, things progressed, uh, we were talking to the realtor, and 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 we've been, you know, dealing with the selling. The, the family property, you know, we dealt with realtors, we've dealt with lawyers, we've dealt with all of the grief and the aggravation that goes with it back home or back up in Delaware. And in, in talking to the realtor, she says, no, we don't, we don't do that here. No, we don't do that here. You, you don't have to do that here. And I, I kept going, well, 
you know, what's the fly in the ointment? What's going to go wrong? What's going to explode to keep this from happening? And as time got closer and closer, it just got easier and easier. And the day we came down to uh, settle and, and take care of all the paperwork, we get here. It was finished in five minutes. Something like that. It was really fast. It was really fast. Now, I have sat in offices with, with people doing real estate transactions before. Hours. Hours. Literally hours. And this was done in five minutes. It was the cleanest, simplest, easiest process, and also the most money I've ever spent in my life. <laughs> But it's just everything worked. And the reason that everything worked the way it did is because of the changes that we had made. What, 15, 16, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. When we began to actually live according to the way the Bible tells you to live, that's what can happen. You don't expect it to happen because that's just not the way the world works. But if you're willing to be faithful, if you're willing to do the things you you need to be doing to start with, it's the way your world will work. It's that simple. And, and, you know, the reason we titled, I titled this one tonight, Let's Get Personal, is because this is our personal journey. This is how God works in our lives. It's how he can work in your life as well. It's not rocket science, okay? If you're willing to follow his plan and his path, you know, hear his voice, do the things he asks you to do, it can be that easy. And you can wonder and you can question and you can squat you know how many times have i said you know if it happened on my time it would have been a long time ago it's not about my time and i know that doesn't keep me from complaining (laughs) (laughs) but what it does do is it keeps you on the creator's timeline you go where he needs you to go you know, did Abraham just automatically pick up, pack up, and walk across, you know, the, the river and on his own? No. No. He needed somebody like the Creator to say, Abraham, now's the time. When he got to where he was going, he waited. He didn't not do anything. You know, he didn't sit there and expect the crows to bring him bread like somebody else, you know, like Elijah, right? He didn't, he knew that he had to keep, he he knew he had to continue to live. So he did what he did. He was, he became a herdsman. He became very wealthy. He had well over 400 servants at his, I won't say back in call, but, you know, he had people that worked for him. He had responsibilities. He had to, to do the things that you would normally do in life to make sure that the people who worked for him were being fed, had clothes to wear, were being taken care of. Had, you know, you do what you got to do. You don't just sit down and wait for God to deliver you know, meals on wheels to your door. It, it doesn't work that way. You have to do something to benefit some people around you. That's what it's all about. And as long as you're doing the things he's asking you to do, whether it's look after the sheep or go rescue Lot or, you know, build an ark, if you're doing those things, you know, maybe, you know, he might be asking you, Go read to that group of kids. They need somebody other than the drag queens to tell them what's really going on in the world. Be a mentor. You know, the, the kid down the hall, you know, he doesn't have a father. He needs somebody to look up to. That little girl over there, she, she really does have a talent for needle and thread. Maybe 
you can teach her how to sew. The person down the street, maybe they need a ride to the to the drugstore. Maybe they need a ride to the market. Those are the ways that you interact with people. Those are the ways that you benefit the people around you. It, you know, you don't have to build an ark. You don't have to go rescue Lot. You don't have to bring down the pillars of the temple. But it's the small, everyday things that you keep doing. And that's exactly what we did. Myra went to work at the hospital every day. and every, Almost every day she would come home and, and tell me about somebody. She never used the name. She, you know, you're not allowed to do that because of the HIPAA regulations unless they gave her permission. Somebody that she interacted with who needed to hear something, something encouraging, something, uh, what's another, something that she, you know, they needed to hear what she had to say. There were times when I would be out and, and meet people, and I have no idea why I met that person. No clue. But apparently something I said got their attention. Whether I was supposed to deliver a message or whether I was supposed to be the one to plant a seed or water the the plant, don't know. Doesn't matter. Uh, There's been times we've been out and I have said things to people that, well, I'll put it this way. It would surprise me to say that to somebody as much as it surprised people that heard it or heard what I said, I should say, because you don't hear those things all the time. You know, I'm I'm the one who uh, is not afraid to tell a pastor you're wrong. I'm the one who's not afraid to tell somebody you're leading these people and you don't have a clue where you're leading them. I'm also the one who's not afraid to tell people, you know, it might be time for you to get your life right. But more often than not, we're the ones that are showing these folks what it looks like when your life is right. And the only reason we're able to do that is because we have been faithful. Or, you know, we're not doing the least we can do. We're doing the most we can do. Now, sometimes things get aggravating, sometimes things get in the way, and that's okay because I have had to learn (laughs) that that means sometimes you need to slow down. Just don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a big rush. It will happen, not when I want it to happen, but when the Creator is ready for it to happen, just like buying this house when it was time when it was his time it was the easiest thing we've ever done and that's what can happen with you as well if you're willing to follow the instructions that he gives you if you're willing to walk in his path listen for his voice and then do the things he asks you to do whether it's smile at somebody You know, I've seen more people smile down here than I ever did back home. (laughs) That that is just, it's just the way folks are here. They enjoy life. And most of the people back in Delaware don't. They don't enjoy living. They don't enjoy life. They don't embrace one of the most important things there is. So it, it's not difficult to do. If it was difficult to do, I wouldn't be sitting here talking about it because I wouldn't have done it. But because it's that easy, because it is that simple, because you can make that kind of a difference, what we see is something completely amazing. We've seen the changes that can happen in our lives. You've heard about some of the things that can happen. 
you know, over the over the past what five or six, I don't know how many years we've been doing this now. Anyway, over the past few years, you, you we've we've given you little bits and pieces, and this is about as much of the story as I can fit into the time I want it to fit in. I mean, there's a, there's a lot more to it. There's, trust me, there's a lot of things that we've done in the last. 17, 18 years that would just should not, should not have happened the way they happened. We've met people in ways that you, you would think would be impossible. We have stood in, (laughs) we have stood in, in the, what do you call in a shopping mall um, between stores not a hallway, I'm not sure what you call it, but like the concourse of a, of a shopping mall. And talk to people for an hour about who God is, who Jesus is, who Yeshua is. That wouldn't have happened. That would not have happened 25 years ago. Probably wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. But now it's like, oh, okay, we can do this. The, the people that we meet and the people we interact with, I think we treat differently now because we look at them differently now. We look at them like people. We don't look at them like, what can you do for me? We don't see them as... Um, subjects. We don't see them as products. We see them as people. And that's a big difference between believers and non-believers. Real believers see each other or see everybody as people. Non-believers typically are going to look at them and they're going to, you know, the first thing they want to know is how is knowing you going to benefit me? And when you change your attitude, and it all comes, it all comes from following his path. It's not difficult. It's not hard. You know, if, if the exiles in Babylon could do it in a, in a drastically terrible situation, if the Jews in the first century could do it in an occupied country. You can, you know, that, that right there is an example. You can do it anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where you are. You get to do as much as you can do. I've spoken with people over the last uh, several months who do live in places where they are persecuted, where life is more difficult for believers than non-believers but they keep going because they realize that when they interact with people in such a way as the Bible describes, it benefits everybody, not, not just yourself, but the other person as well. And that's a big difference. When you think about not being selfish when you meet someone, but um, there's a there's a word for this, <laughs> and it's escaping my brain right now. Inter- interdependence. When you think about not what you can do for me, but what can we do for each other, it changes your attitude. It changes your your outlook. And when you're dealing with people, that's kind of the, the way the Bible describes it. You know, if it's all one-sided, it's not going to be beneficial for anybody. But if you think about it, when you work together, 
look at what you can achieve. I know a lot of people who, you know, I didn't get my way, right? So God must hate me. Well, there's been a lot of things I didn't get. Sometimes, be, you know, especially before, because I wasn't doing the things I was supposed to be doing. But each of those things that I didn't get led me to where I am. Does that make sense? It okay. does. When you are actually living the way you're designed to live, you would be amazed at how it changes your attitude. You learn to see things. You learn to accept things. And you learn to understand that, okay, I asked for this. Hmm. I'm not getting it. Maybe I'm not supposed to have it. But the really neat thing is, Sometimes when you don't get what you want, it's because the creator has something even better in store for you. Why settle for less than he wants to give you? Let me say that again. Why would you want to settle for something less than the one who made you, the one who put you together, the one who knew you before you were born? Why would you settle for anything less than what he wants for you? doesn't matter what it might be. doesn't matter if it's a house. doesn't matter if it's a spouse. I'm not going to keep rhyming that now. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not a rapper. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. If, if you don't get something you think you want, it's probably because there's something better out there waiting for you. All that you have to do is to be faithful and keep walking his path, not your own path. Hopefully, you know, you can sort of get a an idea now that when when we say we encourage you to live the way you're designed to live, the reason is you deserve everything that the Almighty wants you to have. It's not because, you know, you did something good. It's not because, you know, you treated somebody a certain way or you gave money to a certain group of people. It's because you are faithful. You're doing the things that you are supposed to be doing and you made the choice to follow his word, hear his voice, and do the things he's asking you to do. It's that simple. You know, in in the last few weeks, a lot of people have asked us why I'm, I'm sorry, in the last few weeks, a lot of people have asked us why Tennessee what made you come here? I don't know. If I knew, I'd tell you. But apparently, we're here for a reason. Because it was the easiest, other than the aggravation of actually loading the trucks and moving them. <laughs> uh, and going through the grief of unpacking boxes. Because there's things I know are here, we just haven't found them yet. <laughs> Like a needle in a haystack. <laughs> uh, every day, you, it's here. every day is your birthday. You get to open packages and presents every day <laughs> until they're all open and put Ooh, away. Look at this. <clears throat> oh, we brought this. Why did we bring this? But it's, you know, even in that, even in that, there's a reason. I don't know what it might be, but there's a reason. It's not difficult. It really isn't difficult, but hopefully that can encourage some of you. Knowing that, yes, God is working in your life, whether you recognize it or not, whether, (laughs) 
whether you want to see it or not, he's there. You know, there, there are all kinds of things that we see and do, and we sometimes wonder, you know, why did that happen? The next time it happens to you, ask yourself if there's something better. You know, am, am I am I trying to find something small when I should be looking for something big? Am I trying to find uh, something wrong when this is something right? All of those things work together. And hopefully we can expand on that as we continue. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do Monday podcast or not because I haven't looked at my calendar. I, I don't know what day the day is. All I know is it's Thursday. <laughs> but we've got a lot going on still, trying to get some things arranged and uh, make sure everything's taken care of. But I will say this, until next time, we really do wish you many, many blessings. Yes, we do.